I've always been relatively healthy. I grew up in the countryside and was never overweight or with some other chronic diseases. I got into fitness and working out at the age of 18 when I went to the military. Right now, I'm objectively and subjectively speaking in the best health and shape of my life. I've learned a lot about nutrition and exercise over the past 10 years that I've applied to my own life. That's why I'm confident in my ability to maintain this health for decades to come. But what if I was actually an overweight and sick person? In this video, I'm going to outline you how I would go from fat to fit and from unhealthy to healthy. I'm going to outline the first steps and more advanced steps. Alright, so in this hypothetical scenario, instead of me being a lean fit 29 year old who's been working out for over 10 years, I'm actually 50 kilograms overweight, I have borderline diabetes and no idea how to start. But I do want to get healthy again. That's the first key step everyone has to realize. You must want to change and feel better. Because having a sense of purpose and goal is one of the biggest determinants of your behavior and it is also associated with better health outcomes and longevity. Research shows that having a sense of purpose increases motivation, engagement and productivity. Another 2018 study on the offspring of centenarians showed that they had a three times higher likelihood of having a strong purpose in life than age match controls without centenarian parents. Your purpose is your why, the reason you do something. If you don't have a big enough of a why, then you're not going to change and make the necessary improvements. For me, my why and the reason I got into health and longevity in the first place is the fact that my grandfather died to cancer at the age of 36 and two of his brothers died to thrombosis in their 40s. That has been a big enough of why for me to not share the same fate as my grandfather did. So in this hypothetical scenario, I would have the same why. I'm 50 kilos overweight and borderline diabetic. If I keep going, I'm also going to die prematurely like my grandfather. Now that I'm motivated to change, what are the first things that I would do? Number one, I would remove all the junk food from my house, just for the time being. All the frozen pizzas, donuts, cookies, chocolate and whatever else I might have been eating to become overweight. This way I'm less likely to fall off the wagon. My own personality type is that it's very easy for me to just avoid and say no to all the foods if I don't see them and if they're not in my vicinity. If I were to have these snacks in my house, then it's very likely that I'll eventually eat it given the fact that I'm over it and I've, I'm used to eating those foods. Number two, I would stop drinking all alcohol and liquid calories. Alcohol is quite high in calories and it doesn't do anything that would improve your health. I've already been not drinking for the last eight years and it's been one of the best decisions for my health. Number three, I wouldn't drink liquid calories, juices, milk, soda, smoothies, etc. During the weight loss phase, I would avoid all liquid calories because they're not very satiating and they're not essential. The only beverages I would drink would be water, sparkling water, mineral water, black coffee and different types of teas. Diet sodas and different kinds of zero calorie beverages would be fine. And if I were to get a sweet tooth, then I would much rather crack open a diet soda than actually drink regular soda or eat something sweet. A 2024 meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials actually found that people drinking artificially sweetened diet beverages lost more weight than those who drank just water. The reason for that is probably because diet sodas, they don't contain calories, so they're not going to make you gain weight. And they might be satiating, they might reduce your likelihood of eating other sugary foods. So given that in this scenario, I would be overweight and used to drinking regular soda, then just replacing that with diet sodas would increase adherence to the program. And adherence is the most important thing for long-term weight loss success. Number four, I would start walking every day for at least two hours. That's going to give me about 12,000 steps per day. A 2023 meta-analysis on over 111,000 people found that walking 8,700 steps a day compared to 2,000 was linked to a 60% reduction in all-cause mortality. If I'm 50 kilos overweight, then I'm probably just walking 2,000 steps per day. So just going from 2,000 to 8,700 steps per day would reduce my all-cause mortality risk by 60%. But for faster and greater weight loss, then I would need to increase it beyond the 8,000 steps. A 2024 study on people with a higher genetic risk of obesity found that walking two to 6,000 steps more than 8,000 steps was able to reduce the risk of obesity. The studies show that the higher the BMI and the higher the risk of obesity, the more steps are needed to offset the risk of obesity. I don't have a high genetic risk for obesity, but I would still want to walk at least 12,000 steps per day because it's going to increase my energy expenditure and make it easier and faster to lose weight. These are the first things I would do on the same day that I decided to lose some weight. You don't need to go like super hardcore on your first day of deciding to lose weight. It can actually be counterproductive and you might relapse. But you do need to make some first steps. You need to take the first actionable steps as soon as possible. 
to get the momentum going for you. What about my diet plan? Based on the research, then you can lose weight on virtually any kind of a diet as long as you're in a calorie deficit. Metabolic ward studies where people are fed the exact same amount of calories find that there's no difference in weight loss between low-carb and low-fat diets. Low-carb diets in the open world tend to result in greater weight loss initially, but the difference with low-fat diets disappears after about two years. Low-carb diets result in greater weight loss initially because of water weight loss. Having low levels of insulin and eating no carbs makes the body hold onto less water. However, in the long term, there's no difference as long as the calories eaten are the same. The same phenomenon is found with diabetes. In the short term, greater effects from carbohydrate restriction, but no difference in two years. The only macronutrient that is consistently linked to weight loss is protein. Protein has the highest thermic effect of food, which means you burn the most calories digesting protein. Protein is also very satiating and filling. In a 2021 meta-analysis of 37 randomized controlled trials, a protein intake ranging from 18 to 59% of total calories was found to be effective for body weight management especially among individuals with prediabetes. That's exactly my hypothetical self, overweight and with prediabetes. So I would eat a high protein diet to lose the weight. The key here is replacing your other macronutrients, carbohydrates and fats with protein. Because if you add extra protein on top of your already existing diet, then you might not lose the weight. You need to replace the other macronutrients with more protein. Secondly, I would also eat more fiber because fiber intake is even more associated with weight loss and having a lower body weight than protein. There are literally dozens and dozens of studies showing that the people who eat more fiber have lower body weight, lower blood sugar, and are generally healthier. Is fiber magic? No, but fiber is a healthier and low-carb replacement to many other foods that could make you gain weight. That's why for weightless purposes, eating more fiber generally helps. And replacing your other macronutrients, again, carbohydrates and fats, with more fiber helps. So my diet plan would be leaner proteins to minimize the calorie content and a lot of cooked vegetables like broccoli, carrots, onions, tomatoes, etc. I wouldn't add any extra fats or extra carbs because in this phase of the diet, I just want to lose the weight as fast as possible. If I had already lost some weight, and let's say I'm now only 10 kilos overweight, then I would start introducing more carbs to my diet. I'd eat things like sweet potatoes, fruits, and berries. I would also do some form of intermittent fasting because it helps to create a calorie deficit and also reduce the likelihood of overeating calories. If I eat only once or twice a day, then it's very unlikely that I'm going to overeat because I'd be stuffed, especially if I'm eating protein and vegetables. Given the fact that I'm 50 kilograms overweight, then I wouldn't need to eat any more often than once a day. That's exactly what I would do in this scenario. I'd eat once a day, drink coffee in the morning, drink water or diet soda throughout the day, and then eat an early dinner around 4 or 5 p.m. If I were to have already lost some weight and I'm only 10 kilos overweight, then I wouldn't do the one meal a day, I would probably do two meals a day like the 16 and 8 method. I would have my first meal around 10 a.m. and the second meal at 6 p.m. Interestingly, peptides could be the future of longevity supplements. One of the most evidence-based peptides for skin aging is copper peptide GHK. Copper is needed for collagen and elastin synthesis as well as collagen uptake into cells. Copper peptide GHK has been found to modulate skin regeneration and wound healing. In diabetic humans, GHK has been seen to speed up skin healing from ulcers by threefold. GHK copper peptide also modulates antioxidant genes that protect against inflammation, UVB radiation and oxidative stress. So copper peptide GHK helps with collagen synthesis, it helps with skin regeneration, wound healing and skin elasticity. I've been using the Alitura Gold Serum for over a year. The Gold Serum has GHK copper tripeptide that helps with skin regeneration, pigmentation and elasticity. There's also other amazing natural food grade ingredients like marine collagen, organic olive oil, plant retinol, astaxanthin, bee propolis, beeswax, coq10 essential oils and hemp seed oil, all of which support collagen synthesis and skin health. All Alitura skincare products are made of natural ingredients with no microplastics or hormone disruptors, unlike conventional brands. Their products are also bottled in myron glass, free from xenoestrogens and plastics. This makes the gold serum the most unique and powerful skin serum you can use, and I'm personally taking it daily. There are hundreds of positive testimonials and reviews you can check out on the Alitura website for some amazing skin transformations. Use code SEAM for a 20% discount at alitura.com. What about exercise? I already mentioned that I would be walking at least 12,000 steps every day. That's what I would do for the first week, and then I would start increasing my step count to up to 16 to 20,000 steps per day. The truth is that the more steps you take, the more calories you burn, and the faster you're going to lose the weight. 
The reason I won't jump immediately into 20,000 steps per day is because my body probably isn't ready and adapted to walking so much, given the fact that I might have been walking only 2,000 steps per day. So jumping from 2,000 to 20,000 immediately probably isn't feasible for someone who is 50 kilograms overweight. So I want to start slowly and gradually increase my step count the fitter I get. Also, just walking 20,000 steps a day if you're 50 kilos overweight probably isn't that good for your joints and knees. So I want to minimize my risk of injury and I'm going to walk initially a little bit less and then gradually increase it as I lose the weight and as I get fitter. Walking would be my only form of cardio in this phase because I don't think it's healthy to run if you're that heavy. Those extra 50 kilos would wreck your knees. That's why I prefer the low intensity walking over a longer period of time. However, I would do resistance training. Resistance training is the most powerful tool for improving your body composition. It not only helps with weight loss, but it also helps with muscle growth, which you don't get from walking or doing cardio. Resistance training also improves your blood sugar levels. It's true that resistance training itself doesn't burn that many calories, but it does increase your muscle mass, which increases your resting metabolic rate. I'm not going to be able to walk 20,000 steps every day for the rest of my life. That's why having a higher amount of muscle will make my body burn more calories when I'm sitting on a couch, when I'm sleeping, and when I'm not doing anything. That is the real reason why you want to have slightly more muscle tissue. I wouldn't do any kind of CrossFit or some crazy intense weightlifting program. I would just go to the gym three to four times per week and focus on the compound movements. Bench press, deadlift, squat rows, dumbbell curls shoulder press, etc. That's all you need in the beginning. If I've lost some initial weight, then I might implement some high-intensity program or some extra cardio, but not in the beginning. Are there any supplements that I would take? Well, if there were any magical fat loss supplements, then I would take them, but there aren't many effective supplements for weight loss. There's of course Ozempic, but that's a prescription drug. There's also things like Yohimbine, which is a plant that increases your heart rate and increases energy expenditure. But I don't think that would be a good idea for an overweight person who already has cardiac problems. I would use glycine as a sweetener in my coffee and tea because it tastes sweet and has no calories. It also lowers blood sugar levels. And I would maybe take some omega-3s for the blood sugar and lipid panel benefits. Lastly, I might take creatine to help with the gym performance, but it doesn't help with weight loss directly. All of this sounds pretty simple and easy. But why are there so many people who are still sick and overweight? It's because of not following a plan consistently and falling off the wagon too many times. They might follow the diet and workout plan for a few weeks, but then they give in to temptation and eat too much junk food, or they quit entirely. There's also the problem that they might think they're doing everything correctly without realizing that they're still consuming too many calories. These are all the scenarios my hypothetical overweight self would also encounter to a certain extent. Weight loss and getting healthy isn't a straight line like this. Instead, it's like a stair that goes up and down and sometimes stays completely flat at a plateau. However, the general trend needs to be in the right direction for you to make progress. It's in moments like these you need to remember your why. Why are you doing this and why are you trying to lose weight? If eating the cheesecake every night is more important to you than your why, then you'll never get the results that you want. Your purpose needs to be more important than the desire to eat ice cream and skip workouts. For some people, the discipline, the consistency, the why comes easier than the other people. But there is the saying, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. And it doesn't mean that you can't have cheesecake for the rest of your life. Sometimes you can, but probably not all the time. If you want to level up your longevity, then check out my evidence-based longevity routine video. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about staying healthier and living longer. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.